right. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so, so today we're going to continue our discussion of objects. We've introduced polymorphism over the last couple of classes, and this is a concept that can be difficult to understand, and it's also difficult to kind of work with in practice. So what I thought I would do today is actually take a little bit of material out of sequence, and what we're gonna try uh, this is something that we would normally would have talked about on Friday, but I'm gonna try talking about it today. And then on Friday, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk more about polymorphism with this new concept in our vocabulary. Because I think, my hypothesis is this will actually help you understand how polymorphism works. This is also something that's incredibly important to understand about how objects actually work in Java. It's also a really powerful concept in computer science that you see used all over the place. And this is the notion of a reference. And again, what we're gonna do, so, so that's kind of my plan for the next couple classes. So today we're gonna talk about object references. Um, and then, you know, we may end a little bit early today, we'll see, right? But this is another one of these object-oriented concepts. So for the next couple of weeks, the conceptual, you know, challenges in the class are going to, you know, increase as we continue to talk about these different ways of working with objects. And for some of you, particularly people who haven't seen object-oriented pro programming before, I understand this is tough stuff. In fact, some of you that have seen object-oriented programming before haven't seen some of the things that we're gonna talk about, or if you've seen them, you haven't seen them explained very well, and so they didn't make, necessarily make sense at the time. Um, so today we're gonna do references, which are incredibly cool. They've been in front of us this whole time, but we haven't really grappled with what they mean and the implications they have for programming using objects in Java. And then on Friday, we'll go back and we'll talk again more about polymorphism. We'll do some more examples. Um, and again, I think once we talk about references, polymorphism may make a little bit more sense. Because the idea here, and this is something I'll repeat on Friday, but I'm not gonna come back to today, is that when I have a particular type of uh, Java object, what I can actually do is I can get references to it of different types. So we talked about how an object morphs into other kinds of objects, and that doesn't make any sense. Like, morphing is a, is a weasel word that I'm using to hide the truth from you. But what really happens, or what you can really do in Java, is once you have a particular type of object, you're allowed to use reference variables to refer to that object of its type and any of its supertypes. So any of its, uh, you know, ancestor classes. So any object in Java I can refer to with an object reference. Okay, so again, I need to tell you what references are. That's the subject of today's class. So let's start again, as we have a couple times recently, with a motivating example. A place where something isn't working the way that we think it should. So what have I done here? So I've set up a class called person. This is pretty common. Instead of writing setters or getters for name, I just made it public. You know, you should really write setters or getters for it, but I decided not to just to keep it, you know, a little shorter. Um, but I've got a two-string method that uh, prints the name. So I overrode two-string. Remember, that's something I would have normally inherited from my parent class, which is object, because it didn't explicitly extend a class. Now, down here in my example code, I'm doing two things. So let's look at the top block of code first. Let's walk through this. Um, but this actually behaves pretty much how we would expect. So I create two variables. These are primitive types. These variables store Java primitive types. They're lowercase, the two ints. We got comfortable and familiar working with these in the first third of the class. Okay, and here's what I'm doing. Again, maybe this seems very dull, but just bear with me for a minute. You know, I create an int variable called first. I set it to zero. I create an, instant, uh, an int variable called second. I, and I initialize that to the value of first. And then I change the value of second to eight. Okay, and when I print off these two variables, what do I expect? Well, first is zero. Never, never change the value of first. I've initialized second to be zero, which is the value of first, and then I set second to be eight so what I expect here is that first holds zero and second holds eight. 
Okay, so that's our hypothesis about what's gonna happen there. Let's try to apply the same logic to Java objects. Okay. So down here on line 19, I create a new person object. I initialize it with the name required by the one constructor I provided. Line 20, I'm doing something that, again, is very analogous to line 14. So I set this example up intentionally with a lot of parallel structure between these two examples to try to trick you, essentially, so that we can see something that's not behaving the way that we expect, which is gonna launch us into a new observation and a new understanding about how Java actually works. And again, a very, very powerful idea. So I set up my new person variable called me. I initialize it using the new keyword. Great. Okay, so that looks a lot like line 13. Line 20 looks a lot like line 14. I create a new person variable called you. And I initialize it. Now here, again, I'm making this look a lot like the top. So I initialize second using the value of first, and I'm initializing you using the value of me. So far, so good. On line 21, I set you.name to be student, okay? So I've changed something. I've changed something very analogous to the way that I did here. I set the value of second to eight. Here I've set the value of u.name, this public string field that, again, I should have really made private and written setters and getters for, but I didn't because I'm lazy. Um, and so I change it to student. Now, if I follow the example from up top, what do I expect to happen on line 22? Well, I've overridden two string, which is why I can print these objects out directly, but I can actually do that with any Java object. I'll just get the default object to string, which isn't very good, nice to look at. So I've got me, and I've got you. When I created me, the name was Jeff. I set you equal to me, and then I changed your name to student. So what do I expect to happen here? Well, I think this is gonna print me, my name is Jeff, and then you, your name is student. Okay, just like it would at the first example. So let's run this and see what happens. Okay, huh, this is weird. So something, again, this is another one of those places where something happened that we didn't expect. Something happened that is violating our intuition or the intuition that we might have developed as we worked with Java's primitive type. Okay, so something weird is going on here. It seems like, let's try this again. Let's try changing u.name to um, whatever, okay? Huh. So it seems like what's happening is somehow this change that I'm making on line 21 is not just affecting you, u.name. It's also somehow affecting me, the me person variable. In fact, let's just print off me.name here, just to be really explicit about this. It's the same thing. Okay, so something, something's up. Something is different. So let's try to figure out, you know, again, this is a glitch in the matrix. Let's try to figure out what's going on. Let me introduce you to the idea of a reference. And again, references are super powerful. You see them all over the place in computer science. A lot of what you use on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of the names, they use for things, website names, handles on discourse, whatever. These are references. Okay, so what is a reference? A reference is a value that allows a program to indirectly refer to something, right? To a particular datum, which is very, uh, you know, grammatically correct Wikipedia definition. So it's a variable's value or a record in the computer's memory or some other storage device, right? Um, the reference is said to refer to the datum in this case, our datums are objects, okay? So the reference refers to the object, and accessing the object requires dereferencing the reference, or sometimes following is the term that I'll use, following a reference, okay? So all the variables that we've been using, we've been, we haven't really been precise about what's been happening when we've been working with objects in Java. We've been doing things like, you know, uh, line 14, where I've created a, so, so what's actually happening here? Let's walk through this and, and use some of our new syntax to talk about what's going on. So on line six, 
what's actually happening is I'm creating a variable called me that's going to store a reference to a Java object. Now, that variable can store a reference to a person, and on Friday we'll see it can also store a reference to anything that inherits from person, okay? Down here, I'm doing the same thing on line 12, except I'm actually providing an initializer on the right side, which I can do. Now, we can also come back and talk a little bit more about what null is. You wonder, what is this null value? So null is an empty reference. It's the lack of a reference. It's used to set a reference variable to refer to nothing, right? And this is why trying to access a reference variable that's null causes a problem. Because when you use dot notation, what you're doing is you're following a reference. If you try to follow a reference that goes nowhere, you end up in the land of pain and null pointer exception. These are actually the same thing. If I create a reference variable in Java and I don't initialize it, the value is null. But I can also initialize it explicitly to nothing. When I create so again, we've been using this syntax. You guys have been getting comfortable with it on the homework problems, but starting today, we want to be more precise about what's happening. On line 14, what's happening on the right side? I'm creating a new person. So my constructor is going to run, and a new object is going to be created. What actually gets returned from that is a reference to that person object, which I then save in a variable, in the variable me. And again, the compiler will check this for me. It will say, can me store a uh, variable of type person? The answer is yes, because I initialized me to store person references, so I'm good, okay? Now, so I have two reference variables here. So here's the, here's the critical piece, and we're gonna go through a diagram and stuff like that. Don't panic, this is gonna make a lot of sense. Because it actually does make a lot of sense. Um, what happens on line 15, is the critical piece of this puzzle that's gonna allow us to explain what happened on the previous playground slide. This assignment in Java, when you have objects, does not create a new object. So one of the things I'm gonna remind you later in class, it's a good, um, you know, little tip for dealing with this system, is to remember that objects in Java are only created if you see new. So when we get to line 15, how many objects have been created by this piece of code? One. I see new on line 14. I have two references. I have two reference variables, excuse me. I have two reference variables. I have one called me and I have another called you. Both of those can store a reference to a person object. On line 14, I both created a person object and I saved its reference in the variable me. Line 15 does not create a new object. What it does do is it copies the reference from me to the variable you. So now I have two references to the same object. There's only one object in this system. Again, there's no new objects unless you see new. I've only called new once, or I've only used the new keyword once. I've only called the constructor once. At this point, these two reference variables store the same value. And that's why, so if you actually, remember one of the things we told you, you know, again, this is one of those things that didn't make a lot of sense at the time, and now it's gonna make more sense. Don't compare Java objects using double equals. If you have two variables that store Java objects, don't compare them using double equals. Well, hopefully this will make more sense now, because when you use double equals on a reference variable, what you're actually comparing are the references, not the objects themselves. Now here on line 16, you is actually equal to me. These two references refer to the same underlying object, okay? But I can change that. So now on line 17, I'm creating a second object, and I'm going to reassign my variable u that can store a reference to a person object, I'm gonna reassign that to refer to this new person. So now I've got two person objects, and I've got two reference variables, and at this point, 
me refers to the first person object that was created on line 14, you refers to the second person object that was created on line 17. So now when I compare these reference variables using the double equals, uh, comparison operator in Java, that's gonna print false, right? They're no longer the same reference, okay? So let's go through this, okay? So, you know, and again, as, as promised, um, this worked. So let me go back and let's go through this example again and try to understand what's going on. And again, I've got diagrams coming up, stuff like that. This is, you know, references, uh, you hear them, does anyone know any other names for references that you might have heard in other languages? They're sort of like pointers in C++ and C, they're not quite the same thing, uh, but you can think of them as pretty similar. Uh, Python has references, JavaScript has references, pretty much every language, um, you know, every modern language has this idea. And many of them work very, very similar, okay? so. What, so let's go through the bottom half and figure out what happened, okay? I created one person object with the name Jeff on line 19. Then on line 20, I initialized a second reference variable called you that stores a reference of type person, and I copied the reference from me into you. So at this point, me and you refer to the same object. And so if I change me's name, both me and you are going to see that change. If I say, if I change you's name, both me and you are going to see that change. I have two references to one object, okay? How can I make this work differently? Well, so let's say I create a second person. Now I've got two person objects. I have two different references to them. So if I change u.name, I'm changing the object that I created on line 20, only that object. I'm not creating the object that I, I'm not changing the object that I created on line 19. But when I copy the references, I only have one object and I change both. Questions about this before we go on? And again, let me, uh, let me do the reference equality thing too so you guys can see that. So down here I'll print, dot out dot Kirkland you is equal to me and that's true they refer to the same object if I change you to be another person they don't questions about this again I suspect that this is this is going to be tough to work with for a little bit yeah So the, so the question is, well, let's, okay, well, let's do this example. Let's just set you and me back to each other. So, but here's the question. So the question was, if I do this, is there a way to change another object? Was that your question? There's no other object here, right? There's only one. Yeah, there's only a per one person. Okay, now, now here's what could happen. Let's try this. I'm not gonna fully explain this yet, okay? So, let me, let me do this. So now what's happening? Now, on line 19, I create a person reference variable on the left called me, and I initialize it to refer to a new person object that has the name Jeff. On line 20, I create a variable called you that stores a reference to a person and I initialize it to store reference to a new person object that has the name you. Now, at this point, how many objects do I have? Two. I see new here, I see new here. Now, I set you equal to me. Okay? I can do this. This will work. And now let's see what happens. So, that's gonna work fine. What if, okay, so, so here, well, here's the problem. What happens if I want that other person back, that person on line 20 that I created with the name you? What happened to them? How can I, like, I wanna change their name. How do I do that? 
let's see here. If I start right here. Yeah, someone had an idea. To the person you. Yeah. So, and we're gonna, we're gonna use, a, we're gonna use some analogies about references in a minute, so keep that in mind when we come back to that, right? But if you don't have a reference to a Java object anymore, if you overwrite the reference, so after line 20 executed, you had a reference to this new person that I created with the name you. But then on line 21, I overwrote that reference with a copy of the reference that I created to the person that was created with the name Jeff. So there's no reference to the person with the name you anymore. And if you don't have a reference to a Java object, it might as well not exist. And in fact, and we may talk about this, you know, at some point in the future when we want to, you know, understand Java a little better, if you don't have a reference to a Java object, it will actually stop existing at some point. Java's smart enough to realize once you get to line 22, that person that you created with the name you is no longer needed. You can never refer to it. How could you do anything to it? How could you change its name? How could you print it? How could you do anything if you don't have a reference to it? So it'll go away. Java will actually take care of that for you automatically. All right. So let's, let's, um, let's go through some, this is gonna help a lot actually because references are one of the places where we actually have some good real world analogs. So let me give you an example. Um, a phone number. So remember, references are not the thing they refer to. References allow you to refer to something, but they're not the thing that they refer to. So here's an example. A phone number refers to a phone. So I've got a phone over there. I have a number. I could write that number down and give it to you, and then you have a reference to my phone, which you can use to call it. Now again, the phone number is not the phone. If I create 10 more references, if I write my phone number down 10 more times and give it to people here, I don't have 10 phones. That would be pretty cool, actually, if I could do that, but I don't, so I have one phone. The phone number is a reference. The phone is the thing that's referred to. So by giving you my number, you can call the phone. Now, imagine there's a phone in the world that nobody knows the number to. Does that phone really exist or not? You are now in philosophy 101 deep existential question here, right? Does the phone exist, right? It's like when you lose something, right? Does it stop existing? Who knows? Probably not. So a phone number without a phone without a phone number isn't very useful, right? You know, and at some point if somebody, if, if literally nobody had a number to it, then it's not gonna be very good at receiving calls. Now you guys do other things with your phones now, so you might find that phone really useful actually. Um, but the point is that without a number, without anyone being able to refer to it, from the purposes of it being a phone and being able to receive calls, it might as well not exist. So the other thing about references that makes them powerful is that you can control how that reference is used. So let's continue with our phone example. Let's say I stop paying my phone bill, all right? What's the phone company gonna do to the number? So the phone company is the one that controls how that uh, dereferencing process occurs. So when you guys call a phone number, when you pick out your phone, dial the number in, there's this complicated process that goes on where the phone company looks up that number in their database and tries to figure out where the phone is and it has another identifier for it and then eventually this happens within a fraction of a second and my phone starts ringing. But let's say I stop paying my phone bill. What could the phone company do? Month, couple months go by, you know, they've called me, they sent me a bunch of angry emails. At some point, what are they going to do? You're gonna call the number and what's gonna happen? It's not gonna work anymore. The phone company controls the reference. They control the process of dereferencing the number. So if I stop paying my bill, they're gonna say, well, we're gonna stop, that number's not gonna work anymore. When someone calls it, your phone's not gonna ring. Instead, what's gonna happen is they're gonna get a message being like this number is no longer in service or whatever. Right. So here's an example of a reference, another good one. 
a street address, right? I, this is similar to a, a phone, right? So if, and, and let's talk, but let's also talk about how references work when we change things, right? So we'll go back to the example that we let off class with, okay? Let's say, and you guys might like this example, let's say that for some reason, I'm in some sort of fugue state, and I give you, a couple of you guys, my home address. Not planning on doing this. But let's say that one of you goes by and throws eggs at my house. Okay? So my house now has eggs on it. The next person who comes by, what are they going to see on my house? Eggs. I only have one house. If I make ten references to it, but one of you uses that reference to make a change to my house, then those changes are visible by everybody who has the reference. So again, let's go back and look at that playground example quickly. Right? So here, uh, let's do, let's go back to the original version of this. At this point, I've got two Java references that both have, I have two references to the same Java object. Either person who holds, either reference can make a change that is visible to both holders of the reference. So I can use you to change the name, I can use me to change the name. It doesn't matter. I, either one of them will work, because they both, so again, if the first frustrated student eggs my house, it's got egg on it, right? If the second frustrated student eggs my house, it's still got egg on it, right? It doesn't matter which, uh, which reference gets used, okay? All right, I think I have another one here. Ah, yeah, so like, yeah, there's all sorts of things that refer to you as a person. We've tried to set up all of these reference systems. Social security numbers, on campus you have an ID, a university ID number, that's a reference. I can make lots of copies of that number. I'm not making copies of you. That reference refers to you. It's controlled by the university. So at some point, you know, the university may say, okay, well, this person isn't a student here anymore, and I'm going to take that university ID, and I'm going to destroy it, or I'm going to give it to somebody else. They probably don't do that. They probably keep that around forever. All right, questions about this, now that we have some, some physical analog. All right. Oh, sorry. Ah, good, okay, good question. So the question is, how do I copy an object in Java? So let's say I actually want a copy of the object, not just a copy of the reference. All right, so first of all, let me just, let's just review and reinforce the fact that copying an object, copying a reference does not copy the object. So again, if I give one person a copy of my phone number and you make ten copies of it, I only have one phone. You could be one copy of my street address and you make ten copies of it, I only have one house. You're copying a reference, you're not copying the underlying object, right? Um, okay, I just said these things. Um, so, and, and you know, again, here's the example. So I made a copy of the reference on line six, but I still only have one person option, right? So let's actually walk through what's happening. I promised some diagrams, okay? So let's actually walk through kind of a visual depiction of what's going on, all right? Me is a variable that stores a reference. I'm going to depict that with an arrow coming out of me pointing at the object that refers to. Right now, when I've created me initially, it's empty. It does not store a reference. What value do we use to refer to this in Java? No. Okay. And I should have, I, I'll, I'll come back and reiterate this on Friday with the slide. When you use dot notation, what you're actually doing is following a reference. So that's why if you take null and try to call to string on it, you get a null pointer exception. So right now here, my person, um, my person reference is null. So let's try to call, try to call to string on that guy. And you're going to see that, oh, it's, it's mad at me, okay. Let's initialize it to null because this will fool the compiler, which is kind of dumb, actually. Um, so yeah, so here we go. Now we have our null pointer exception. Okay, great. So at this point, I can't do anything with person, it's empty. Once I set it to refer to a new person object, so the new keyword 
is what created this object over here on the right. So this is my visual depiction of an object. I don't want you guys to get too addicted to these kind of diagrams. There's some, you know, um, courses that largely rely on these type of visual aids to help you understand this stuff. And here's the problem. You have to develop your own internal mental models for figuring this out, right? Um, you know, particularly for sort of doing some of these basic things. When you go to, you know, a software development company or you go to some place that's doing really cutting edge computer science, you don't see this type of diagram all over the place because people have internalized this at the point that they can work with it without having to draw a lot of pictures. That takes practice. You guys will get it, but here's one place where I'm gonna draw a picture. Okay, so now my person, my reference variable me has a reference. It refers to this new person that I just created, and the age is zero because that's the default initial value for an int, right? So I created a new person, I've got no constructor for this uh, class, and so int is set to zero by default. Remember, that's, you can look up those defaults in the Java documentation. All right, now, okay, so now things have gotten more complicated, and this is an important picture to understand. Now I've created a second reference variable called u that also refers to the same object. So both of these reference variables are set up to store a reference to a person. Me, I, in, I set to the reference that was returned when I created that person object. And now I've copied the reference from me into you. So what really matters here is the endpoint of this reference. So these two, you know, it, 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 you know, they're different places on the slide, but they had, they store the same reference. And so now, if I change, oh, did my diagram break? Oh, it didn't like this, okay. This is, hold on a sec, let me, uh, this guy. Let me do something quickly. Because we need, We need this diagram, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I made the mistake of trying to change this right before class, which is dumb. So let me, okay, so these are from last, these are from last, um, last semester, but it's the same, same example, the, the number is a little different, okay? All right, so I have the second reference. Now, if I change age, so here's what I'm doing. I'm using my me reference to set the age of this person. But there's only one person in the system, okay? So hopefully it's a little more clear from this that both me and you are going to see that change. Both me and you can make that change. I could have used you here and set, used you to set the age. I used me, okay? Now if, and, and both me and you will see the change. So both me and you can set the age of this one person object that I have in the system that I created on line four, and both the, that change will be visible to both me and you, okay? So again, um, no, this, this works as expected. Questions about this, All right? So this is, this is the, you know, the thing to start keeping in mind when we start working with references. There's this separation. The variable doesn't store the object. The variable stores a reference to the object. It allows you to make changes, to, you know, call methods, to change public instance variables, um, but those changes are visible to anyone else who has a reference to the same object. All right, questions before we go on? Let me do a few other things. Yeah. What's that? Ah, let me come back and answer that in a minute. Yeah, so the question was, when, like, why would I do this? Why would I need two references to the object? Yeah. I'll come, I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, actually, you know what? Let me, um, let's see here. I'm gonna go back to my other slides, so, that's your credit, okay, good. All right, I'll come back and do this one at the end. Ah, so here's, here's one of the reasons why. So, when I call a function or a method in Java, and that method has a parameter or an argument that's an, that's an object, 
what I'm actually passing to that method is an object reference. And in fact, I'm passing a copy of the reference that I used to call the method, right? So here's an example on line 11. I've created a person with initial age of 39. And then I call this function called birthday. That function takes a person as an argument. And it increments the person's age and returns their new age. So this code is going to operate on the person object that was created on line 11. Again, how many times do we see new in this code? Once. There is only one person object that's being created as part of this example. So on line 11, or sorry, when I, on line 12, when I call birthday, what happens is birthday's initial argument to set is set to a copy of the reference variable me that's passed as an argument. What that means is that the function can change the object that you pass in. So in this case, it's modifying that person's age. So here's an example. So essentially, while birthday is running, I have two references to the same person object. One that's being used by the birthday function, and the second one that's being held by the caller of the function. So this is one place where you would essentially have two references being made. It's a good question. And again, this allows functions in Java to modify the objects that they are passed, right? So if you make changes to an object inside a function, those changes are visible to the caller of the function, right? Um, and again, this, these, these should work better than they do. Let me go back to other slides. There we go, yeah. So here's the diagram version of this. I create a person with age 38. I call birthday. When birthday is running, the code that called birthday still has a reference to that person called me, but birthday also has a reference to a call to set. They refer to the same person. So when birthday makes a change to the person, that change is now visible to the caller once the method's complete. Yeah. So this is one place where I would do this. Right, good question. All right, let me, uh, let me bring up one more thing. We're gonna in, get into the end here. So when I create an array of Java objects, what's actually in that array, just like variables in Java store a reference to an object, not an object itself, arrays of objects store references to those objects, not the objects themselves. So this is in a playground that we're about to to mess with, but let, let me just go through what's happening here. So I have, now, now here's where things get a little tricky. So I see new here, but what's actually being created here? So this is, is this a person? It's an array of references to person objects. So I've created an array called people that will be able to store four references to person objects. What do you think the default initial value inside that array is? No, they're empty. Java does not create those objects for you. That's your responsibility, which we're gonna about to do right here, okay? So now on line 11, Again, this is one of those examples that I would, you know, ponder after class, ask about on the forum. If you can understand how this works, then you understand how references work in Java. Um, on line 11, I'm creating a second array of, that's going to store references to person objects. That second array is called same people, and it's gonna store, also store four references to person objects. Now what I did in this loop from eight to 10, now I'm calling new. So you see me call new, and I'm creating persons with ages starting at zero, starting at 18, sorry, 18, 19, 20, 21. The loop runs four times. So after, when I get to line 11, my array people now is full of references to actual Java 
person objects that I created inside the loop. Now what I do inside this loop is different. Do you see new? No. I'm not creating person objects. Instead what I'm doing is I'm copying the references from people into same people. So, just, you know, like when I get to do the fun thing with my fingers, it's not a very good diagram. Um, you know, you imagine I have an array, right? That array was filled with references to person objects. I now have a second array that has references to those same objects. So I have two arrays that together are storing eight references to Java person objects, but I've only created four Java person objects. So every Java, every person that I created was initially stored in one place in the people array, and then I made a copy of it in the same people array. So now I've got two copies of that reference. Now I'm gonna go through my first array and increase everybody's age. And then I'm gonna go through my second array and print everybody's age. So what you're gonna see, what this is gonna show you is that people and same people actually have references to the same object, okay? So let's, let's do this. Let's take this out and see what happens. So now I'm removing my modification. If I remove the modification that was done between lines 18 and 20, you'll still see that same people stores the references to the people objects that I initially saved in the people array. So down here, I can go through either same people or people. So if I go through people, this works identically. The reason is that both arrays store references to the same object. Likewise, I can make the modifications to either same people or to people. These two arrays store references to the same object. So now if I do this, you'll see that everybody's age is increased by 10. Okay, the years fly by. Questions about this example? Again, we're gonna toss this out right at the end of class, give you something to chew on a little bit. But if you can, if you can work, you know, in a part of working with Java's objects and part of actually uh, becoming a great computer scientist is learning how to internalize some of these systems so that you can think about them effectively. You know, draw some pictures when you're getting started, but start to work on building your own mental models about how this stuff works, right? All right, as a reminder, there's a little cheat sheet here. Oh, wait, sorry, object copying. Um, yeah, so someone, so this is actually a great place to finish, because someone had asked, how do I copy Java objects? The answer is, there is no built-in way to do this in Java. You might think, that seems really obvious. Like, I have an object, and I actually want another object that has the same content as the first object. Why isn't there a nice way to do this in Java? Um, and it turns out that the reason is that sometimes objects have state that they don't want to be copied to another object, okay? But if you want to actually copy Java objects, you have some options. So object provides this thing called clone that doesn't actually do what you think it does. So that's actually not an option. One good option is to implement something called a copy constructor. So between line six and eight, I'm showing an example of a copy constructor for my person class. How does this work? What it does is it takes another person, it takes a reference to another person object. It's a constructor. You see that it starts, capital person, same name as the class, doesn't have a return type. This is a constructor. But it's a constructor that takes as its argument a reference to another object of the same type. And then in here, you can copy over anything that you want from the other class. So in this case, my person when I use the copy constructor, will return a person that has the same age. Let me go back, let's just do this here quickly. Um, so here's my second person object. Let's do that. And now, you know, we'll go back and we'll say, so now we actually have a way to copy person object, so. So now I have a constructor for person that will take a person reference. Right? But I do have two different, 
person sphere. Let's make sure that that's the true. So I'm going to set the age of the second person object to 18, and you'll see that it's not reflected, right? Or sorry, it is reflected there. Sorry, I've got to print the first one so we make sure that we don't have uh, a reference, right? So if this was a reference, then the age of the first instance would change. It's not. It's, a, it's its own object because I provided this copy constructor up here. Now, the nice thing about a copy constructor is you control what gets copied. This is code that you write. If you want to leave off some fields, if you have a field that you say, you know what, that, that shouldn't be copied when I copy an object, you can do that. Right, so this is the option that gives you um, the most control, and this is the thing that's the most common. You can actually, this is one of those things that you can actually get IntelliJ to generate for you. It's boilerplate code, it's not super exciting, but I think there's a, you know, an option with IntelliJ that says, you know, generate method, and you can have it generate this copy constructor for you. Okay. So again, let me just summarize what we talked about today in a couple of, a couple of points. Unless you see new, there's no new object that's been created. Objects are only created in Java when you see the new keyword. Only. Period. There are no exceptions to this. You can hide it inside a function or whatever, but you can put it inside a loop. But I only create a Java object when I use new. And the, the type that comes after new is the actual type of the Java object, which will become more important once we go back onto polymorphism on Friday. The variables that store objects in Java, all of them, actually store references to objects. So when you copy one to another, you're copying the references, you're not copying the objects themselves. Okay? All right. So, oh, I need to, I need to throw this out there very quickly because you need it for today's homework problem. Um, this is one of the last little bits of Java uh, keyword bingo that we're doing this semester. Um, so final is another modifier that I can add to a class. If I add final to a class, it means that that class cannot be extended. So if I make a class final, then nobody can extend that class, okay? This is just a little bit of esoterica that you need for today's homework problem. All right. I have an important announcement as you guys are getting up. So after talking to the CA captains, we've decided to move our Wednesday night office hours to Friday. So there will be no office hours today after five. There will be office hours starting this week on Fridays from 5 to 8 p.m. Okay, so hopefully that is agreeable. You know, they feel like that's going to do a better job of meeting need. I have office hours today, 1 to 3. Um, enjoy the beautiful day. I will see you guys on Friday. We still have office hours from 12 to 5, just not from 5 to 8.